What are your thoughts on Sam Harris's idea that we can eventually use neuroscience to quantify human well-being and use that information to empirically evaluate ethics? Sam Harris has written a new book, a very interesting book, called The Moral Landscape. And he takes on the almost cliché of philosophy that science has nothing to say about morality. Science can tell us the how of things. Science cannot tell us what's good and what's bad. Well, I think maybe Sam's got a point. Sam thinks that you can. And he thinks that neuroscience can actually be used to tell when people are really, really suffering. You do have to make the assumption that what matters is suffering. You do have to make the assumption that the goal of morality is something like to reduce the total amount of suffering, to reduce the amount of suffering in either humans or sentient beings. But once you've done that, once you've accepted that that's your goal in your morality, then science, especially neuroscience, really can tell you when people suffer, when creatures suffer. And so I think he's got a very good point, and I strongly recommend the book, The Moral Landscape. What is your most scientifically unsubstantiated personal belief? I believe that if life is ever discovered elsewhere in the universe, however strange and alien and weird and un unworldly it is, there's one thing we can be pretty sure of, and that is that it will be Darwinian life, that it will have evolved by something akin to Darwinian natural selection. It certainly will have evolved in a gradual sense. There will be no sudden jumping into existence of complicated life. The only way you can get complexity, the only way you can get the, the prodigious complexity that is, is life, is by slow, gradual degrees. So it's going to be evolutionary. And now I stick my neck out a bit more. This is a bit harder to substantiate. I don't think there's any other way of doing it than something that's roughly equivalent to Darwinian natural selection. That's to say, random variation followed by uh, non-random survival. Schools in America seem to be mute on evolution so as not to pick a fight with intelligent designers. So why aren't American scientists more vocal about this and what can be done? Well, this is one of the things that the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science is most interested in, is education. And uh, obviously, since I'm an evolutionist, I'm particularly interested in educating in evolution. Um, so as not to pick a fight with intelligent design people. Well, I don't mind picking a fight with intelligent design people, and I'd like to encourage teachers to do the same. I was at a conference in Minneapolis of biology teachers uh, quite recently, last week, and my neighbour at dinner had won an award for teaching evolution. And his technique was to avoid using the word, to avoid even telling the students that he was teaching them evolution, but just teach it to them anyway, and then let them in on the secret rather late on that that's what it was about. And that's not what, that wouldn't be my way. I mean, my, my way would be if I felt that there were students there who, indeed, he, he did say that some of his colleagues were frightened of teaching evolution because the moment they said they were going to teach evolution, they got yelled at by some of the students. And I said, well, my reaction to that would be just to throw them out uh, because they're wasting the time of, of the other students. However, I did, I did um, see his point. As for what scientists can do and as for what the Richard Dawkins Foundation can do, I think we need to provide the resources, we need to provide the backing, we need to provide books, uh, lesson plans, films, videos, um, resources to help teachers to teach what is, after all, the central theorem of their subject. And it's fascinating, by the way. I mean, it is the most interesting part of biology. It makes the whole thing hang together. It explains why we exist. What could be more fascinating than that? Where do you see religious fundamentalism in 5, 10, 50 years? And where do you see science in 5, 10, 50 years? I'm not very good at second-guessing the future of the zeitgeist. And so I'm not really sure what is going to happen about religious fundamentalism. I could easily say what I hope will happen. And that's the way people often answer a question like that. Obviously what I hope will happen is that not only fundamentalism but all religion will be dead. Um, but I don't think that's very realistic. Um, however, I think I've learned over the course of my life that, that when people do make forecasts they're very often wrong. 
and, and very often we do get, get surprises. What I'm more confident about is where, where will science be? I mean, science is going to go on from strength to strength. Uh, science hasn't yet solved all the problems of the universe, uh, and maybe it never will, but science is on the right track, and historically that's a trend which is going to continue. Um, in my own subject of biology, it's going to be largely a matter of, I think, filling in the details. In physics, uh, it could well be that physics either comes to an end when everything is solved, when we have a, a grand unified theory, a theory of everything. And about half the physicists I know think that is going to happen. And the other half think, no, there's always going to be more vistas to explore. Uh, you, you, you go over one horizon and that was, that's wonderful, but then that simply opens the door to new, uh, new problems that need to be solved. Either of those possibilities seems to me to be almost equally exciting. It's very exciting to think that one, that one day, maybe within our lifetime, physics will solve all the outstanding problems. But it's equally exciting to think that maybe it never will and that there are always going to be open questions, profound questions that, that need to be solved. So the future of science is rosy and exciting. What can atheists do, particularly in countries dominated by religion, to reduce the influence of religion and to move toward a more secular atheist society? It's a very difficult question to know what you can do in those countries which are not only dominated by religion but are politically dominated in the sense that it's actually quite risky uh, to life and limb to come out as an atheist or to come out as a member of the wrong religion. I do think that there is hope in the internet. I think there's hope in the speed with which ideas can spread, given the, the, given the modern internet. And so um, I think that one of the things that atheists can do is to try to propagate the truth, uh, scientific truth, reason, um, skeptical, critical thinking, um, over, over the internet, perhaps try to get speakers of other languages where, uh, where religion is dominant in an oppressive way. In America, I think we may be close to a tipping point. We may be close to a critical mass where if just a few more people come out as atheists, that might, be, that might open floodgates. That might um, open a new rush of people to come out. And so that's what I would say for America, uh, that, that my, my goal there, and what, this is one of the goals of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, is to push up to the tipping point, up to the point of um, critical mass. In your opinion, what are the three most important unanswered questions in biology? How does consciousness evolve and what is consciousness? How did life itself begin from non-life? What was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule, the first gene, in effect? That would be the second one. And the third one would be, why do we have sex? Out of all the evidence used to support the theory of evolution, what would you say is the strongest, most irrefutable single piece of evidence in support of the theory? There's an enormous amount of evidence from all sorts of places and it's hard to pick um, one strand which is more important than any other. Uh, there's fossils, there's the evidence from geographical distribution, there's the evidence from vestigial organs. I think to me perhaps the most compelling evidence is comparative evidence from modern animals, particularly biochemical comparative evidence, genetic molecular evidence. If you take any set of animals and identify the same gene in different animals. And you really can do that because the, 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 the letters of the DNA code, uh, they're, they're the same code in all animals, and you really can find a gene which is the same in, say, all mammals. For example, there's a gene called FOXP2, which is a couple of thousand letters long, and most of the letters are the same in any mammal, so you know it's the same gene. And then you go through and you literally count the number of genes, a number of letters that are different. So in the case of FOXP2, uh, if you count the number of letters that are different between humans and chimpanzees, it's only about nine. 
uh, if you count the number of letters that are different in humans and mice, it's, I don't know, 30 or something like that, if you different between humans. Actually, frogs have them as well, and you, you find a couple of hundred that are different. So, you can take any pair of animals you like, kangaroo and lion, uh, horse and cat, human and rat, any pair of animals you like, and count the number of differences in the letters of a particular gene. And you plot it out, and you find that it forms a perfect branching hierarchy. It's a tree. And what else could that tree be but a family tree? And then you do the same thing for another gene. Having got the family tree for FOXP2, you then do the same thing for another gene, and another, and another. You get the same family tree. Um, you also get the same family tree if you take genes that are no longer functional, that are just vestigial, they're not doing anything. It's like fragments of a document on your hard disk which are no longer being used. They're no, lo no longer on the directory, so you no longer see them. Again, you get the same family tree. This is overwhelmingly strong evidence. The only way you could get out of saying that that proves that evolution is true is by saying that the intelligent designer, God, deliberately set out to lie to us, deliberately set out to deceive us. Would you please be so kind as to read some of your hate mail in that adorable British accent? You do not believe in the existence of God, but you believe in aliens. But the very existence of your animosity, hatred, and mockery towards him proves your hypocrisy. I suggest that you find the longest crowbar you can find to pull your head out of your behind. If there is no order in evolution, how were you born with your head on your shoulders? <laughs> Dorkings? You're so smart in your own eyes, you can't comprehend simple Bible passages and misconstrue them for your own bullshit dogma. <laughs> I read your book about the Bible. It is totally sucks ass and is biased and one-sided propaganda. Your theory sucks. You are not as wise as you think you are. You hypocrites want to condemn anybody for making mistakes or believing different from your bullshit, retard, atheism dogma. <laughs> Dawkins' books are fucking stupid bullshit. <laughs> if you do not have God in your life, then what is the point of your life? Pointless. When you die, that's it. Game over. How pointless is that? I really feel sorry for you all. But it's not too late to turn to God. Three words from God to you. Dear Atheist, this is what God says about you. You are a fool! <laughs> this one is from somebody called Anne Coulter. I defy any of my co-religionists to tell me they do not laugh at the idea of Dawkins burning in hell. You suck! Go burn in hell! Satan will enjoy torturing you. What happened? Mum didn't pay enough attention to you, so you decided to rebel. I hope for your own sake you see your grave mistake and repent. God dwells among as every day. You are the spawn of evil. Christian living for God. <laughs> I hope you die slowly and you fucking burn in hell, you damn blasphemy. Right now you are rotting on the inside. But you must know that there is indeed a God, a great God and he will forgive you if you regret from your fucking behaviour. <laughs> and you should realise that your entire life has been a delusion, and that right now, your destiny is all fucked up, <laughs> fucking atheist. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Our God is a loving God. But if you keep peddling this kind of filth, then I pity you when Jesus returns. <laughs> I hate your fucking guts. Ha ha, you fucking dumbass. I hope you get hit by a church van tonight and you die slowly.
Thank you for joining me in a reading of my hate mail.